How's that? Is that good? Okay. So, uh, recently anyway, a, a major source of skepticism about free will is the idea that uh, conscious intentions and conscious decisions play no role at all in uh, action production. And that's uh, my point of departure for this talk. And my question really is, do conscious intentions and conscious decisions ever play a role? in producing action. Um, I'm sure you've heard about Libet studies earlier. I just got here uh, Thursday night. And I'll be talking a bit about Libet studies, but I'll try to make the, uh, that part of it relatively quick. Um, so what are decisions and intentions? And we're talking about decisions to do things and intentions to do things. So I think of a decision to do something as a very brief action of forming an intention to do it. Uh, Libet thinks of decisions like this too, and, and lots of people. So a decision is, uh, you could think of, it's an action of forming an intention to do a thing. And intentions and decisions come in different kinds. Here are two main kinds. There are proximal intentions and decisions. And uh, a proximal decision is a decision you make now to do something now like my decision now to do this amazing thing now. Uh, a distal decision is a decision you make now to do something later. And the same thing for intentions. So I intend now to do this now. Not as good at it, left-handed. Um, but I also intend now to fly back to Florida tomorrow afternoon. And that's a distal intention. Now the Libet studies and studies of uh, their kind are all about proximal decisions and intentions. Uh, decisions to do something now, or an intention to do something now. In Libet's study, it's a, it's a wrist flexion. It's something you do right away. Um, OK, is there evidence? And I'm just talking about evidence now, not proof, that uh, conscious intentions or decisions are ever among the causes of corresponding actions. Well, there are these really interesting studies on implementation intentions. They've been going on for years now, and uh, they're remarkably effective. An implementation intention is conditional in form. Um, so it's, if it's 2 o'clock and it's Tuesday, then I should start exercising. They have a form like that. And the people who do this work, Peter Gullwitzer is the main figure, and people in social psychology will know the work, uh, make a distinction between a goal intention, like uh, an intention to exercise sometime or other next week, and an implementation intention, which picks out in advance a place and time to do it. And I will talk about uh, three of these studies. There are well over a hundred, and there are um, reviews of studies and so on, easy to find on the web. Um, the breast self-exam study. So you get uh, a group of women who are highly motivated to do a breast self-exam sometime next month. And you talk to them about things, including the benefits of doing it. Uh, and then half of the women you say to, um, well, please pick now a place and time to do it next month and write it down for us. And women given that instruction, 100% did the breast self-exam the next month, and all but one did it at basically the place and time they selected in advance, and only 53% of the control group did it. So you get this huge boost in success rate uh, just by getting them to form implementation intentions. And of course, the intentions are consciously formed and consciously reported. OK. Uh, here's another study. It's an exercise study. Um, and it's about exercising next week, and people are given a lot of information indicating that you know exercising is a very healthy thing. Uh, in the implementation intention group, they're given one more instruction. So decide now 
uh, before you leave the room when and where you'll do it next week and write it down for us. Uh, and the figures here were 91% for the implementation intention group. They did it. And only 39% uh, of the control group. And again, the, uh, the intentions are conscious and they're consciously reported. Uh, the addicts one is cute. Uh, so these are addicts who are about to go back into the workplace and um, they need to write a resume by the end of the day. And half of them are told, okay, so decide when and where to eat lunch. And the other half are told, okay, so decide now uh, when and where to write your resume, write it down for us. 80% uh, of those given the implementation intention instruction wrote a resume by the end of the day, and none of the other ones did. And again, these are conscious intentions, and they're consciously reported. Um, here's a quotation from one of the meta-analyses. This <clears throat> is from a paper by Goldwitzer and Sheeran. Findings from 94 independent tests showed that implementation intentions had a positive effect of medium to large magnitude on goal attainment. Now, so now at this point, we have theoretical options. And somebody might suggest, well, it isn't being conscious of the implementation intention that does any work at all, um, an unconscious one would work just as well. Now that actually is testable. What you would need to do is to figure out how to induce an unconscious implementation intention, say to do a breast self-exam next month or exercise next week, you know, at a particular place in time, and see how effective the unconscious ones are. Suppose it were to turn out that the unconscious ones were more effective than what we see in the control group. So in the case of the breast self-exam, maybe you boost it 15%. That would show that the unconscious implementation intentions are doing some work. But suppose they fall well short of the conscious ones. Well, then you'd have evidence that being conscious of an implementation intention does some work. It boosts the effectiveness rate. Um, so the task, the main and interesting task, would be to figure out a way of inducing unconscious implementation intentions. Um, and I actually know somebody who's working on this now. I have this huge free will grant, so I've been able to fund a lot of uh, good science of free will work. And uh, somebody is, at this moment, trying to use hypnosis to induce unconscious implementation intentions. And we'll see how it goes. It'd be nice to have evidence about it. OK. Um, another option is to say, oh, it isn't the conscious implementation intentions that are boosting the success rate. It's the neural correlates of those intentions and of consciousness of them, or end of being conscious of them. But now we have a hypothesis that isn't scientifically testable. This is a metaphysical thesis. And you know it's up to metaphysicians to work out various views on mind-body relations. Um, but I, I don't see how this could be studied scientifically. The first option is kind of interesting. And we could try to see whether unconscious implementation intentions are as effective as conscious ones. We have a nice kind of theory about how the conscious ones work. So you decide today to do the breast self-exam uh, I don't know, next Friday after dinner, and now it's next Friday after dinner, and you remember, you consciously remember your implementation intention, and you execute it. So that's kind of nice. We have a theory about how that works. How might it work unconsciously? Well, you know, that's something to be worked out. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit about Libet. So I guess you know the experimental design. So subjects are supposed to flex a wrist, whenever they want, and then after they flex, they're supposed to report where the spot was on a very fast clock, makes a complete revolution in two and a half seconds, when they first felt the urge, intention, wish, will, or whatever to flex. They need to flex at least 40 times to get uh, readings that are readable, and um, EEG is taken from the scalp, and there's an electromyograph that's going to measure muscle motion. And what Libet discovered is that when subjects were regularly reminded not to plan in advance when to flex, and when after the fact they reported that they never did plan, 
you got an EEG ramp up that started 550 milliseconds before the muscle burst. But the average time of first reported awareness of the intention urge or whatever was 206 milliseconds, about 200 milliseconds before the muscle burst. And so Libet says, oh, well, look what's going on here. The beginning of the EEG ramp up is when the decision is made, so 550 milliseconds before the muscle burst, and the person doesn't become aware of this decision for another third of a second or so. Um, so the decision's being made unconsciously, and so free will isn't involved because Libet thought free will was essentially a conscious phenomenon. Uh, you probably heard about the veto. Oh yeah, I heard something about the veto yesterday. So Libet thought that once you became conscious of the urge, intention, wish, or will, they keep using different terms, uh, you have the possibility to veto it, and that's where free will comes in. It isn't a power to initiate actions, it's just a power to uh, shut down processes. So Ramachandran says, Libet doesn't believe in free will, but he does believe in free won't. Okay? Those neuroscientists don't tell great jokes, you know, it's not my fault. It's his. Okay. Um, all right. I'm just going to talk about a couple of problems. I want to keep this part quick. And I could have a problem. I've given so many lectures on different aspects of the Libet stuff that I could slip into one or the other. So I have a conscious intention now not to do that. And, uh, and we'll see if it works. Now, one thing Libet does is to generalize from his apparent findings in this scenario to all cases. So here's a quotation. Our overall findings do suggest some fundamental characteristics of the simpler acts that may be applicable to all consciously intended acts and even to responsibility and free will. Okay, and so what you might wonder when you hear that is, can you generalize from a scenario like this to all cases? And then one question you might have might be, well, how much is decision making in this kind of case like decision making in very different kinds of cases? Now, maybe most of you don't know about Buridan's ass. It's either a donkey or a mule. I, for I forget what an ass is exactly, but it's one of those two animals. And it's, uh, it's hyper-rational and it's midway between two equivalent bales of hay. So it's hungry, hyper-rational, equidistant from these two things. Because it's hyper-rational, it will only do a thing if it has a reason to do it that's better than a reason to do anything else. Okay? And so it looks at this bale, it looks at that bale, it sees how far it is from each. Uh, it doesn't have a reason to prefer this to that or that to this, so it starves to death. Okay, that's a problem about being hyper-rational. Um, now, in the Libet task, the subject in a Libet task is in a situation like that. So you can flex at this moment, or that moment, or that moment, and there's no reason to prefer any of those moments over any other. So what the subjects are going to do is pick. And now recall that they're instructed not to think in advance about when to do it, so no conscious reasoning about that kind of thing is supposed to be involved. And when people do think in advance about when to do it, you get a different EEG readout. It starts up a, a lot earlier, over a half a second earlier. So how much is picking in a Bearden's ass kind of case, or a Libet style case, like deciding about whether to propose marriage or reject a marriage proposal or except this great job rather than that one, um, and so on. Well, maybe not much at all. Uh, and in the case of deciding about marriage proposals and the like, I suppose there's, I, I'm married for my second time now, so I know this, you know, there's a lot of conscious thinking. Uh, shall I do it? Uh, what are the dangers? What are the pros? What are the cons? Um, and I come to some kind of decision at the end. But that's really not at all, not much like Libet's study at all, where you're just picking a moment. And so the generalizing is hard to do. Um, it's really a stretch. Okay, so that's one kind of point. Um, would unconscious intentions to flex be just as effective as conscious ones? That may be the case. In fact, I suspect it is true. Uh, so now here I'm going to set, my set, uh, set myself the goal of flexing every once in a while while I talk to you. And I, I can do it quite fine. And I'm not conscious of any 
intention to flex just then. I have this kind of general guiding intention, you know, do it every once in a while. Um, but I wasn't conscious of specific intentions to flex at the moment, specific proximal intentions. Um, and Libet's subjects can have that general kind of goal, you know, flex every once in a while. Why do they need conscious intentions? Not to generate the, the actions. I can do that without conscious intentions. To have something to report because their assignment is to flex whenever they want and then report after they flex on where the spot was on the clock when they first became aware of the urge or whatever, right? So it seems to me that being conscious of the intention in the Libet style study has a function that isn't an action production function, it's a, a reporting function. It's there for the purposes of reporting. Now I had intended not to do this, but if I say this, it'll, it'll make this all make more sense. So I was a subject in a Libet style experiment. I gave some talks at the National Institutes of Health, and the plan was I give my talk, uh, then I'm a subject in the experiment, and then they take me out to dinner. This was years ago, it was maybe 2005. And so um, I wanted to be a naive subject, so what I thought is I would just sit in that chair and I'd wait for these urges to flex now, to arise, and then I would flex, and then I would report on the clock, you know, uh, where it was when I first became aware of the urge. And so I'm sitting there waiting for the urges, and nothing's happening. You know, no urges are popping up, no conscious decisions, no intentions, just thoughts about how the heck do I do this, and, and how do other people do it, and I really would like to have dinner sooner or later. So I hit on this strategy. I would say now to myself, silently, and flex in response to the now saying, and then report a little bit later where the spot was on the clock when I said now to myself. And you report by moving a cursor to that spot. Um, what was the now saying for? Not really to generate the actions, it was to have something to report. Okay, so that illustrates my point about the work that consciousness seems to be doing in this case. And it's a report function. Um, okay. All right, so the question was, might, conscious, might unconscious intentions work as well as conscious ones? Answer, yes, probably for generating the action, but no uh, for generating the consciousness reports. Well, how about this question? It's at the top of page two. How about conscious intentions versus the neural correlates of conscious intentions? Well, there again, uh, we've asked a metaphysical question, something that isn't testable scientifically. So that's a question that's interesting for metaphysicians. Um, I, th I think it shouldn't be interesting to scientists because what should be interesting to scientists is testable hypotheses and then experiments that can give us some evidence about them. Uh, okay, two more just quick problems about the Libet thing. So what happens at minus 550 milliseconds. That is when the EEG starts ramping up. Libet says a decision is made. That's, you know, that's one hypothesis about it. But what else might it be? Well, one way to get evidence about it is to see how long it takes a proximal decision or a proximal intention to generate a muscle burst. Like, does it take about half a second? Does it take less time? Now, there's indirect evidence about it actually out there in the world. And it's a, it's a go signal reaction time test where subjects were watching a Libet clock. Now, you want them to be watching a Libet clock to get relevant evidence because watching the clock is going to slow down reaction time. And in the Libet experiment, they are watching the clock. So we have that. Um, and subjects were supposed to click a mouse button when they got the go signal. Now one hypothesis about what goes on in response to go signals in these tests is that the go signal produces an intention. And then the intention can produce the muscle burst. Produces an intention whether that intention is conscious or not. Okay? Um, the average time in this study between the sounding of the go signal and the muscle burst was 231 milliseconds. 
Now, if what happens is you have a go signal followed by an intention that generates a muscle burst, then the average time between proximal intention acquisition and muscle burst is going to be less than 231 milliseconds. It takes time to detect a signal and so on. So this is some evidence that what's going on in Libet's study at minus 550, and really for quite some time, isn't that an intention is already present or a decision has been made, but that there's some preparatory activity that may or may not actually lead to an intention or a decision a bit later. There's other evidence, too, that converges on this. I'm not going to go through it because then I really will spin off into another talk. Okay. So now that you've heard me say that, you might think, oh, but maybe the point of no return is reached at minus 550, so that even if there's no decision or intention at that point, things are up and running that ensure that an inten uh, intention or decision will happen a bit later and that the guy will uh, flex his wrist about half a second later. So you might think you've hit the short version. You've hit the point of no return here. Um, okay. Now, here's a crucial point once you get to the point of no return hypothesis. Here's a quotation from Libet. In the absence of the muscle's electrical signal when being activated, there was no trigger to initiate the computer's recording of any preceding brain activity. What he's saying is this. When you do EEG, you do something called back averaging. And what you need is a signal that tells your computer when to make a record of the preceding second or so of brain activity. And what Libet is saying here is that the signal he used in his main experiment was the muscle burst. So it's the muscle burst, the beginning of muscle motion, that triggers the computer to make a record of the preceding brain activity. Now, if you want to see whether brain activity at minus 550 uh, is such that you've hit the point of no return, and it's ensured that you'll get a muscle burst at zero, what you need to look for, what you need to try to find, you know, for falsifiability, is brain activity of that kind where there is no later muscle burst. But given the methodology here, you can't do it because it's the muscle burst that does the triggering. Okay? So everybody's got that. So you can't infer from those data that the point of no return has been hit at that time. Okay. Now, Another thing that leads people astray is just, uh, we'll say, faulty causal reasoning. Um, here are a couple of quotations. The first one is from Roddy uh, Rodiger. Clearly, conscious intention cannot cause an action if a neural event that precedes and correlates with the action comes before conscious intention. Um, so you've got neural event, it's correlated with the action, and we've got the conscious intention in between. And he's saying, well, if that's how it is, the conscious intention can't be a cause of the action. Or here's uh, Sue Pocket, a similar claim. In the case of very simple voluntary acts, such as pressing a button whenever one feels like it, good experimental evidence shows that the consciousness of being about to move arises before the movement occurs, but after the neural events leading up to the movement have begun. It is a reasonable conclusion that consciousness is not the immediate cause of this simple kind of behavior. So here again, you've got this kind of reasoning. So now think about my analogy that's on the sheet. So think about how firecrackers work. You light the wick, and then the wick burns down to the gunpowder, and then you have an explosion. So lighting the wick occurs before the burning of the fuse, but the burning of the fuse is certainly part of the causal process that leads to the explosion. If the fuse didn't burn all the way down, there would be no explosion. And similarly, you can have neural activity that produces a conscious intention that in turn produces a muscle burst. So this is just very strange causal reasoning, and it leads people astray. It's as though only the thing at the beginning of a causal process can be a cause of the final result, whereas typically, uh, you know, processes are kind of long, they are causal chains, and all the different parts are causally involved. Um, okay, do I want to say anything more about that? Well, maybe not right now. Um, and then another question. Does conscious reasoning ever play a role in the production of intentions and actions? I think this is a very good and important question, and I think it's 
more important in a way than the question whether conscious decisions ever play a role. Uh, more important especially for free will because I think of free will as involved more in important decisions than in things like picking a moment to begin flexing at or going to the supermarket knowing you're going to get a 16 ounce jar of planters peanuts and picking that one. Um, that, that doesn't seem so, so important. So suppose you know, we did some nice tests, and I know people who are, who are running experiments on this, and uh, we discover that we have good reason to believe that conscious reasoning does sometimes play a role in action production. Um, but suppose we also learned that we're just a bit off at consciously detecting our decisions, and there's a, a time lag between when a decision made on the basis of careful conscious reasoning uh, is made and conscious detection of it. Suppose we discover that. Some theories would predict it, like David's. Um, should we worry much about uh, free will? I don't think so. It could just be that human beings are a little slow at detecting their intentions. And what's really doing important work is the conscious reasoning that leads up to the decision. OK. I don't know how I did on time. OK. All right. So I'll stop there and take questions.